Hi there, welcome back. Well, <laughs> there's been quite a bit of uh, mechanical and um, housekeeping work on this radio in the last day, day and a half since my last video. When I finished off last, uh, we determined that uh, this thing was actually receiving on FM and on the AM bands, which was uh, great news, but I still needed to uh, check the AM and FM circuits, change the capacitors and so on. And I had a hell of a lot of uh, cleaning and uh, correcting and fixing to do. So um, what I'll be doing here is showing you what I've done uh, in all aspects. And we'll end with testing the AM, because that's the one that I've completed and checked completely. And the fact that the tuning condenser or the uh, dial string has been restrung here also helps a bit. So we should be able to get a good, uh, a good uh, view of the result. Let me go through this in parts. As you can see, the dial string is there for the AM, and I've used just a cotton cord. This is the sort of stuff you get in a hardware store or in an art shop or stationery shop. Nothing special. This isn't particularly good dial cord, but it does the job. And somebody mentioned that this is really hard to restring. Well, yeah, it is if you've got the front cover on. It's a real bummer because you've got to get these things stuck in there. But if you get it out, if you do this, then it's actually quite a breeze. And what makes it a lot easier actually is that it's got two parts. This uh, spring here actually connects two halves of the, of the dial cord. This is not a single cord that goes all the way around like some of them are. This thing has got one rotating clockwise out of there and the other one going counterclockwise out of there and they sort of do their thing and then they meet up here and you tie them up with this uh, spring, which makes it a hell of a lot easier to work with because it does, it means that you can actually just do the one side, leave it longer than you need, do the other one, leave it longer than you need. And then you come and meet them up in the middle and you try and get the spring in exactly the right position. And the reason you want it in the right position is because the uh, indicator, this thing's going to go left and right, and you want the indicator to not get stuck there. You don't want the spring just to go back into the pulley because then it won't get through. So the, the idea is just give it a hell of a lot of extra string and uh, test it, and you can actually get this done quite easily. And I'll show you uh, with reference to the service manual drawings that we have there. So what we're looking at here is the top one, which is the AM. And they actually tell you this, the approximate lengths of each half. One of them is in cloth and the other one is in steel. I haven't gone to that extreme. I've actually just used cloth um, on both. And it makes no difference on this one. And the steel, well, the wire they've got there on the FM, which is still complete, and I won't be going into that because I didn't have to rewire it or restring it. That steel is all pretty, well, it's going to get rusty. It's not too bad at the moment. It'll last, but um, I prefer just to use string. It's easier for me. I've done this in the past and I've used guitar string, old guitar, guitar string, the E string, perfect for this. So the way to look at this is what I've done is I've made the, um, I've closed the condenser completely. So meshed it completely. And um, you'll find that this gap here will end up more or less horizontally there, just like that one. That's not necessarily true because there is a, an adjustment screw on there. You can actually remove this whole thing and twist it. And then what you do is you've got the one hook and you see that it comes around and it goes around twice because you've got it going through there. It goes around there, around once, another once, and then it goes over the top through the spindle and that spindle, you've got to pass it around twice. And then it goes through that one pulley, the second pulley, and then it's going to meet the spring. So that would be one piece of string. And then over here, you just leave a hell of a long piece and uh, just clip it temporarily to the chassis with a, a bit of tape or something. The other one clips on there and it goes once. Actually, no, it goes from there and it goes straight through. You can see there's no uh, circle around here, no turn around it. In that position, remember the condenser is completely meshed. So it goes over there, over there, and it goes along through that pulley, comes back, 
and it meets the uh, the spring again. So that's the other piece of string you you, you put on there. You forget about the uh, the pointer. The pointer just sort of clips in. You sort of fit it in, and it clips in place, and you can move it around. And then what you've got to do is, in the closed position, you've got to make sure the spring is far enough to the right so that the pointer, which cannot go over the spring, obviously, is actually going to point to the right end of the dial. And then when you turn the condenser the opposite way, in other words, when you unmesh it, this thing has got to hit the other side, approximately at the end of the dial. Now, I say approximately because you can just slide this a little bit left and right. So... No big deal when you have access to the front, okay? Now, this could be completely wrong. This could be, this could have been twisted. This whole shot, this whole uh, wheel here, you can actually unscrew it and turn it around. This could have been undone. So you could have a different picture. But the idea is mesh the condenser and have it all set to the right. And then you'll, when you unmesh it, you'll find that the uh, indicator will slide along and with the full rotation, or rather the full opening of the condenser, this thing will slide from one end to the other. Let me show you in loco. Now this isn't too easy to see, but the string coming from that top turn goes through there twice. This is the AM1 is the back one. It comes through this pulley, through that pulley, and it goes along here to the spring. Now the other one goes from there it's hooked down there, it goes there, it goes up there, and it goes along here to this pulley over here, comes back, and it's tied to the spring as well. Now, the idea is you've got to leave the spring a little bit longer. In other words, you've got to make sure that uh, you tighten this quite well, but it does stretch somewhat. Because this isn't proper dial cord, it will stretch. So if you leave this a little bit tight. In other words, if you make sure the spring is pretty sprung out, it'll probably pull in as this stretches to, you know, where the st string tension is uh, is there, but not too much. There's also a trick you can use. If you then have to tighten this some more, then what you simply do is you remove that there and you tie a couple of knots on here. Now you know that it won't go further than that, right? So if you tie a few knots on here, you're shortening the string, but you're not going to get it to go over that pulley. That's the important thing. And then the actual uh, dial indicator just slips on. At the back, you've got one, two, three, four, five ridges, and it sort of goes top, under, top, under, top. So that's the dial string. And the FM one is working perfectly, so I just left it. I um, lubricated Everything that's movable on here, all the pulleys have been lubricated. The inner shaft there has been lubricated. Those pulleys at the end here have also been done. There's uh, the FM1 down here and the AM1 up there. So everything's lubricated. Everything's in place. That sort of does the, um, the dial string uh, saga for now. You may notice that it's uh, looking a lot cleaner now. That's because quite a bit of cleaning has been done. And I'll tell you what I did. I cleaned it with uh, isopropyl alcohol like I've shown you before. And then I went one step further and I actually cleaned it with a little bit of uh, acetone. And that sort of took the final bit of grime off the uh, chassis. Now, I've got to warn you and I've got to explain to you why I used acetone. This stuff here is actually a paint. I know it's a paint because it comes off with acetone. <laughs> this is where you've got to be careful. If you overdo the acetone, you actually get through to the metal. You remove the paint completely. And the way to determine whether it is paint or whether it's uh, an actual um, alloy coating is with a multimeter. If you stick a multimeter on here, you get absolutely no continuity until you put a bit of pressure on so that it breaks through the paint and gets to the metal. This is pretty common with some of the Grindex, and some of them have actually got a gold, um, sort of a golden or coppery finish. That's also paint. And I found that out the hard way when I started cleaning with acetone and went straight through to the metal. So the way to do it is with a small amount of acetone on a ball of cotton wool, you just gently brush it. And what tends to happen is 
part of the top coat of that paint dissolves and whatever dirt and grime is on there comes off. And you'll see the paint come off on your uh, cotton wool. But it, it gives it a fantastic finish. I mean, obviously the age marks are there. It's a bit of pitting and so on. But it really cleans up nicely. And then, of course, the other trick that I mentioned is um, using some um, WD-40. And the WD-40 was uh, painted on, brushed on. Everything that's, uh, that would benefit from it, not the, the actual paintwork, but the transformers, the phenolic uh, sheets over there. There's also some on the ferrite antenna. That ferrite antenna has seen a little bit of uh, WD-40, the back phenolic sheet where the antenna sockets are. So it's looking pretty good. It's looking pretty good. And uh, at the top... That sort of is about it. I want to show you something else at the back. Using a Dremel and some of those uh, brushes that I've actually, I, I started buying them, found they were too expensive and made them myself. Um, I've actually done a video on how to do those things. I can't remember what I called them. If you brush that, you get all the brass coming through. Now this was all black and it really gives it a neat look. It just makes it pop out. Um, I've got that here. And I've actually done the same with the fuse holders, just gently brushing with the Dremel. All the brass comes out and it looks really, really nice. Now that back plate, that plate that we had on here, it was pretty grimy. So I did the next best thing, which is just sprayed it. There's a black uh, line over here, put some tape over there, some spray paint, cleaned it first, obviously, spray paint. And we've got ourselves a brand new plate, back plate. And this thing can now go in because all the screws have also been de-rusted. And so this thing can go in and we can get our radio looking like a radio again. And then also finish putting in the dial lamps, which have obviously been cleaned as well. There we are. Nice. This thing's looking like new. Cleaning the glass is a challenge because you've got to be incredibly careful because you may remove the lettering at the back. In some cases, the lettering has actually got a coating on the top. In some cases, it doesn't. So you have to be very careful. What I've noticed is uh, this region over here, it had some tape at the back there where it leaned against the chassis. And that stuff uh, basically corroded through. And I had to paint through the back, at the back, with a bit of uh, brown paint. You do the best you can. There's two spots like that. Unfortunately, nothing I can do about that. There's the other spot over there. And that is, as you can see, painted at the back there and painted there. The other thing is this uses a, um, like a cloth tape that they use to prevent any direct contact with the chassis. That's it there. I've replaced everywhere that has this tape. And the stuff I use is this band-aid, this old-fashioned band-aid, which is actually uh, cloth. You can still get it. It's about the same size. It was probably the stuff they used back when they built this thing. Who knows? So you cut pieces of it and you put it wherever they've got the, the band-aid or that uh, tape. And there are quite a few places. Uh, it's over here. It's back on the chassis. And there's also one other element which we need to look at, and that is the the uh, magic eye holder that fits on the one side here and that's also got pieces of tape put in there as well this thing was de-rusted this thing was completely black all the rubbers that uh, actually fit onto the glass have been cleaned out and so it's time to put this thing back and uh, we'll get the the faceplate on
we've got the tube holder back in place. Now you've got to be careful because you don't want to put too much pressure on this. This is glass. So whenever you tighten these, make sure you don't overdo it. You've got these clips at the top that you tighten. Not too tight. Be careful. There's rubber supports at the bottom at the top. So you've got to be very careful you don't over tighten that because you again you can break the glass. And the same applies to the other side. And that part is done. These knobs have got these ridges in here. They tend to get filthy, so the thing to do is put them in some uh, dishwasher fluid and water. Just leave it there for a while, and then you brush this out with a toothbrush or a little brush. And then what I do here is I uh, polish it with a Dremel, and again using those little brushes that I've made for about three cents each or whatever. And look at the result. This thing came out perfectly. These things were completely black. I think it looks great. They came out absolutely perfectly. And of course, these things really do make a difference to the radio. Big, 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 big difference. So we're ready to put them on. And here we are. Thing to remember is not to tighten them too close to the glass. Leave about a millimeter, millimeter and a half from the glass. And also on this particular one, there's a switch. When you pull it out, for the antenna. So make sure that you put this switch in before you fix the, uh, the knobs, otherwise you won't be able to push back. I think that's what happened in the last uh, repair or inter interaction somebody had with this. They actually put the switch in, rather pulled the switch out and uh, fitted the knobs as far back as they'd go so you couldn't actually switch it. It was already out. And that's our front panel. Looks pretty good. Those piano keys really shine. And then of course the knobs with the brass ring on it just give it that little bit of extra magic. This is what it should look like. And we're not finished yet. We still got the lamps to put back on. They go up here. And they literally just pop in. Or they should pop in. There we go. And this one's got a ground that you have to solder to the chassis. That clip there tightens that to it. And once you've done that, that front panel is done. Now we're back to the underside. And what I did was I went through the entire AM circuit, the RF circuit. And the reason I do the AM is that um, after the signal comes out of the FM front end, it literally goes through the switching and into the same uh, part of the circuit, same circuit really, that goes on through um, to the end, almost to the end, because it's the IF and the IF transformers, and they use the same transformer, but there's obviously an FM section and an AM section. So once you check all that, you can more or less sort of assume, <laughs> wrong word, that the FM is checked. Then there are a few little particularities with the FM that we have to check later. But with the AM, I went through the circuit again from antenna right into the radio and I changed a few caps. There aren't that many. Nothing in here. There was nothing that needed changing in here. It was all checked. There were a couple, there were a couple of caps down here. Um, a lot of the caps are those sort of dog bony things. These things are always, so far, spot on. Uh, not much. There's not much. There's a couple back there. That electrolytic over here is the discriminator cap on the FM, which I haven't changed yet. I probably will have to. Depends on what the FM sounds like. We'll check that later. But so what I did here was I went again through this whole thing it's important that you familiar, familiarize yourself with the, the switching on here because this is exactly what is in the switching diagram on the schematic. When it tells you uh, on the schematic switch 7C, you can go there, you know that's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, A, B, C, and you can follow it from there because you've got access to it. It's not a problem. 
And here's the result of all that checking. We've uh, literally got the whole thing painted except the FM. And that means following the signal all the way from the antenna through the uh, RF front end into the mixer, mixer oscillator with the oscillator section down here. And then of course it goes through the IF transformer, gets to the uh, detector here and all the way through to where it becomes audio and you switch between radio and pickup, which we saw way back. When you have to measure continuity and you want to measure whether the, uh, the uh, coils are okay, sometimes what you need to do is go to that switch. For example, if you want to measure that one there, it's easier to go to the switch, 10E, follow it through and see where you can measure it again. And the next place is 7C. So if you measure that with a few ohms, you know this continuity. It's, it's not that difficult. Sometimes it is, but in this particular case, it was not that difficult. And what I did find was that one of the uh, ferrite antenna coils was actually open. And it was open because the solder connection was loose from the actual ferrite coil. So, and that thing was so fine, you couldn't see it. It was, it was there. But uh, when I measured continuity between 7C and 10E, I got zilch. And when I followed it through, I found that one of these wires was actually desoldered. So I soldered it back and it's back in place. So checking these things does pay off. And the result is that the whole signal path has been checked. And you can see that there haven't really been that many changes of components. If you remember, this section here was done before. So effectively, in this radio section, what I've changed is one, two, three, four, five capacitors. Five capacitors and corrected one unsoldered um, piece of hair wire, <laughs> of antenna wire. You, I probably wouldn't have needed to do that. I could see these capacitors. I could see these capacitors just looking at it. So I could have changed it and, and not done all this. But hey, when you're sitting indoors, nothing else to do and you enjoy it, it does add to your learning. It does add to your understanding of how the whole thing works. So now what I want to do is test the radio again, the AM, and um, perhaps even in this video do an alignment, which shouldn't be too difficult. This thing is a 460, I believe it's 460 kilohertz IF. Yeah, it's 460. Where have I seen it? Where have I seen it? I'm not sure. Um, actually, yes, I've seen it in the above, um, in the actual service manual part. And the service manual tells us how to do the alignment. Basically, what they say is 460 kilohertz, put in a carrier, 30% modulated with an audio signal. It's the usual you're uh, emulating, or yeah, you're emulating the, uh, the IF frequency and you pass it into the, you can do it in two stages. I prefer to do it right from the beginning to end because I know that this thing's receiving something. If it was completely deaf, you'd have to do the, the, the final end first and then the first one. Uh, but I do it from the grid of the ECH81. So grid one of ECH81, you feed the signal in and then you adjust these coils three, or Roman numeral three and four, and then one and two to get the maximum audio. And uh, I'm not going to worry too much about bandwidth because they, they, they talk about getting a bandwidth of 4.5 kilohertz and you should dampen the opposite coil. Honestly, I haven't found that to be really necessary. And I really don't have the equipment that would um, allow me to even go that deep into, into this whole alignment thing. I, I prefer to do it my way and it sounds good and the result works. So hey, that's, that's the way I'm going to do it. I'll show you what it is we're doing here. We, we can find these coils, Roman numerals, remember? One, two, three, and four. They show us on here where they are. Looking from the back, it's the top one and the under one the top one and the under one. So you've got to get access from the top and you've got to get access from underneath and you've got to be careful uh, not to use, well, you shouldn't use a, a screwdriver because it could break the cores. I use a wooden uh, kebab stick, tape it at the end, it works quite well and it doesn't break. It breaks before the cores do. 
I have to remove the wax that's on the top and bottom, which is sometimes a bigger challenge than the actual alignment. And then I'm going to measure the uh, AC voltage at the speaker. In other words, I'm going to measure the amplitude of the signal that's going through of that 455 kilohertz carrier with the modulated signal. I'm going to measure the modulated signal amplitude as it goes through and comes out of the speaker. I'll also put it on the scope so we can sort of see it. So as usual, I've set up the signal generator with a 460 uh, kilohertz carrier signal. Minimum amplitude, it won't go any lower than 1.4 millivolts RMS. I've got a modulated signal. Let's do a 30% modulation. It is AM modulation. The AM frequency, the tone is 600 hertz and it's a sine wave. And I can activate or deactivate modulation. I've got this um, attenuator, it's AC coupled, so I don't have to worry about DC going back into the signal generator. And I can attenuate 6, 12 or 18 dB. At the moment I've click them all. So I've actually got 36 dB of attenuation. And then I can just drop it to see uh, what size signal I want going in, because I think I know 1.4 millivolts is going to be too high. I need to make the signal as small as possible so that it doesn't actually activate the, uh, the AGC circuit, the automatic gain control. I've got that signal going to pin 2 of the ECH81. That's the grid 1. It's pin 2 and uh, obviously the ground of the signal generator signal is going to ground. I've got the radio on its side so that I can access the cores both at the bottom and at the top. And I know it's the right hand ones on either IF transformer. <laughs> be careful if you choose, uh, if you adjust the wrong one, you're going to be messing with the FM. The radio is set to medium wave tuned to a place with hopefully no stations. The audio is connected to the dummy load with speaker or dummy load activation here. The scope is seeing the output. And then I've also got the AC uh, voltmeter connected across the output so that I can see it on a moving uh, coil meter, which is easier to adjust than a digital one or even than the scope. So I'm going to focus on the uh, meter once we get started and see what happens. The radio is on. I've got the volume on max. I'm at a place where there are no stations here. And I'm going to activate the uh, input signal by activating the channel of the signal generator. And we can sort of hear something. Not quite discernible as a sine wave yet, but let's see if we can improve that. Remember, I've got 36 dB of attenuation on there. So if I take off 6 dB, it's becoming noisier. Take out the modulation. Modulation's on. I'm going to put this on dummy so we don't have to hear that. Is the volume still on full? That's getting better. I've got 18 dB of attenuation. It's starting to look like a sine wave. Let me just make sure that the tuning is not affecting it. I'm going to give it 12. There we go. I've got 24 dB of attenuation. I think that's something we can work with. In fact, we can probably go lower. I can probably leave it at 24 dB of attenuation because I do see the meter working. The first thing I'm going to check is, before going any further, I'm going to see what frequency it's actually giving me the biggest uh, signal on. Now, that's the signal at 460 kilohertz, which is supposed to be the IF frequency. Now, if I go to 461, it gets smaller. 462 gets smaller. 461, 460, 459, 58, it actually goes higher. So this is slightly detuned. It's a very small difference, but between 458 over here and 460, 
460 is just slightly lower. So I know it's slightly out of tune. Now I'm going to focus on the uh, analog meter and that'll be a lot better for us to see. Okay, so here we go. I'm going to start with the one at the bottom. I'm not even sure which, which one I'm doing, if uh, it's the first one or the last one. With AM, it doesn't really matter. Oh, it's improving somewhat. Let me go to a peak. There's my peak. I'll go to the top one. Wrong way. Ooh. There's my peak. Now that might have been me having detuned it when I took the, uh, tried to scrape the wax off. Doesn't mean someone's been in there. I don't think anybody's been in there because the wax was pretty original. I'm going to the other IF transformer. No, that's pretty much spot on. Pretty much spot on. Now the top. There we go. That, my friends, is all it is. I think it is aligned. I'm going back to the bottom of the other one, and there's no difference whatsoever. You can go back and forth a few times. The uh, AMIF has been aligned. As simple as that. It's more preparation work than actual doing, and there are a few things you've got to be careful with. You have to be very careful with what you use to actually... Uh, Align these things. I use a kebab stick, which I then just file at the end into sort of a, a screwdriver head. This one is just filed to fit in there nicely. I've actually put in a, a knob there, which allows you a little bit more control when you're twisting it. And that way, this thing will break before your cores do. If your cores break, it's not the end of the world, but it is a pain in the butt. So there we are. That's done. That is done. Now, there is one other alignment you can do, and that is that you put in a signal. You put in the 460 kilohertz signal at the antenna input, right at the antenna input. And then there's something called the IF trap. There is a coil here which is supposed to uh, not allow 460 kilohertz signals coming in from the antenna. Now that can be one of two reasons. One is if you have another radio next door and it's creating an IF uh, that could interfere with yours, the, um, the radiated signal from the radio next door shouldn't come into your antenna because that messes up what you're trying to create. You're trying to take an external frequency and the uh, tune frequency and you're trying to create a, a 460 kilohertz IF with the modulation on top of that. You don't want somebody else's IF to interfere with yours. The other thing is it stops it radiating out of the antenna. So it stops the radio becoming a transmitter of this IF frequency. And that um, coil is actually this one over here. It's actually this one over here. That's called the IF trap. Now what I need to do is put the same 460 kilohertz signal with the modulation on there, leave all the measuring in the same place, and I need to adjust this till the signal getting through is as small as possible. In other words, I need a negative peak. So I need to move these guys to the antenna input, and then we'll check the meter again. Okay, so I've had to increase the uh, amplitude of the signal quite significantly, because I was getting absolutely nothing, which means the trap was working. But now I've got it to a point where I can read it, and I'm going to adjust that coil. And this time I want a minimum. See, that goes higher. I want a minimum. And I'm winding it through, and it's coming up. So that is where I want to be. There. Now, there is something wrong with this. And I'll tell you what it is. This thing is tuning. Um, it's basically creating, you're creating a resonant point where it is allowing as much of the 460 kilohertz 
through this coil to ground. It's basically leaking it to ground as possible. And because this is a resonant circuit, it also is affected by the characteristics of the actual antenna because this, is, this thing is getting the signal straight from the antenna. And this is where the problem is. Depending on the impedance of your antenna, depending on whether it's a long wire, short wire, whatever wire it's made of, the impedance of that thing can be very quite dramatically. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's not really going to be perfectly tuned with the signal with the signal generator connected straight into it because the characteristics of the signal generator are different to the antenna i mean the signal generator's output impedance is 50 ohms and the impedance of a long wire is a few k so so now we should have our radio pretty much aligned and ready to test well here goes i've got it on long wave i've got it on i've got Bass and discount, bass and treble. I'll leave it on, leave it on bass. Jazz and orchestra, leave it on orchestra. And long wave, mini whip antenna. Starting at 150 kilohertz. This is amazing. This is long wave. This thing is from, I mean, it's in French. It could be from North Africa, but I don't think any radio in Madeira gets long wave normally. Um, this is uh, not so much the radio as the mini whip antenna, which works very, very well at low frequencies. This thing looks, sounds better than our local medium wave station. This is in English, and I think it's around, this is around 100, well, just under 200 kilohertz. I think this is uh, BBC4 from the south of England. Not as clear as I've got it before, but it's, it's there. And this is our beacon, according to one of the uh, one of the comments. This is uh, in Porto Santo, which is part of the Madeira Islands. I didn't even know that. So this is 20 kilometers away, 20 20 miles away actually. So long wave, yeah, it works pretty well. Let's go down to the bottom of the band and um, and try medium wave. Now this is late morning, so I'm making excuses already. Don't expect much. Canary Islands. All these are Canary Islands. This is North Africa. And this is the only Madeiran AM radio station. So that's pretty good. That's working pretty well. And um, it's pretty good actually for this time of day. In the evening, the AM gets pretty packed on these with the, especially with the mini whip. Let's try shortwave. This one goes from 5.9 to 16 megahertz. So we're down at 5.9. 5.9. 
49 meter bands or so. As expected, this time of day, it'll be sort of in the higher frequencies. This tuning is very, very sensitive. So, as expected at this time of day, the um, upper frequencies are the ones that are more busy on shortwave, so from about 13, 14 megahertz onwards. As we go on to the afternoon, the band starts coming down, and then you start sort of getting better reception from 14 down to about 10, and it goes on to lower frequencies in the evening. So, our AM is actually working. It's working pretty well, actually. And... I think I'm going to take a break from this video today because this one, this one has been, yeah, this one's been a bit, a bit tough because it's had a lot of sort of <laughs> uninteresting crap to deal with, cleaning and polishing and all that jazz, which, as I've repeatedly said, is not my favorite topic, and I don't want to bore you too much with that as well. So I'm going to stop for now, and I'll be coming back with the next video, which will have, probably have a bit. A few more housekeeping uh, tasks, but uh, we'll be doing uh, the testing and probably the alignment of the FM. So thanks for watching. Thanks for all the incredible comments you've been giving me on, on the videos. Um, once again, thanks for your company. Hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, please share, subscribe, like, and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel, you can do so on Patreon. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.